Okay, we are live. Welcome <clears throat> to JWC live stream. Mm -hmm. This is Story Autopsy, JWC Story Autopsy with Ricky and Tom with special guest uh, Amber. Um, is it Amber Danson? Is that how yeah. it is? Okay, great. Um, how have you guys been? Uh, I mean, I know we had that meeting the other day, but how, how are things going? Uh, I'm doing great. How about you, Tom, Amber? Amber first. Oh, I'm starting to get writing things done again. I've had a little bit of a dry spell. Uh -oh. I was doing mostly uh, editing things, and half of that was editing other people's stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I did, I did uh, a whole bunch of writing on my phone, actually. And yeah, I did uh, like six pages of writing on my phone because wow. I had an idea while I was away from my computer and just had to write. That's that's excellent. It's great to stay creative. These are these are times where creativity is more valuable than ever. Um helps take our mind off things. Uh, I know it brings me episodic satisfaction. How about you, Tom? How are you doing lately? Everything good? Yeah, excellent. Um, I, I started writing a, uh, I have a horror novel that I'm writing that uh, I'm starting to write uh, some point of view portions from the monster's point of view. of a, And uh, that's really satisfying, getting into the mind of a, of a, uh, a an odd creature that, uh, you know, very Crazy. much, very much the case, yeah. Yeah, it needs to be refined. I need to do, it's got a single mindset. You know, I'm hungry, and uh, it's raining out, and there's a new moon. I'm, I, I, I need some people to eat. And uh, <laughs> Nice, nice. I like, nice. I like, I need some long pig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice predatory awareness helps to instantly raise the tension for the reader. Always a good decision. And the way uh, you execute it, I mean, and, and you too, Amber, after that that read of that, um, that Bigfoot story uh, the other day, um, really, really tasty stuff, man. Non-human awareness, non-human intelligence being executed here. For the fantasy writer or the horror writer, this is... Um, it's an excellent place to find yourself when you can execute that. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. I'm, a, I, I'm a, uh, a lifelong studier of, of all things Bigfoot, etc. And and uh, I've seen every episode of yep. Finding Bigfoot. It's, you name it on television that has to do with Bigfoot. I've seen it, and uh, that took me right there to one of those episodes. It was very, 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 very good. Dig it, yeah, I'm for sure. Except this one had some results. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right on. That's true. A lot of those shows, it's just they're more chasing a goose than they are Bigfoot. Um, but anyway, uh, so let's let's get down to the creativity. Um, mm -hmm. Where where have we been that way? It's nice to ask about our 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 actual identities and stuff, but, but like what how we are in the world. But the creativity is why we're here. So, Amber, what have you been working on lately? What's your current work in progress? Well, it's a speculative, prehistoric, post-apocalyptic fiction piece. Nice. Yeah. Full on, full on with tongue twister too, and you you nailed it. That's good. I like it. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, prehistoric post post apocalyptic is a uh, an interesting uh, mix. Yep. Yeah, it's uh, the sequel to my first, or not my first novel, the sequel to the Shattered Sky, my dinosaur novel, where all of the dinosaurs are uh, living their life, and then the meteor comes and everything changes. Mm. And it's a sort of speculative fiction because it theorizes on what small ones could do to survive if they had a certain precognizance. Mm, right on, right on. Um, that's a very, very interesting type of fiction. And I, I'm going to have to check that out, uh, give that a read. 
Um, how hmm. about you? How about you, Tom? What's going on with you? What's your work in progress? Uh, I'm in the middle of an interesting chapter on in the bride of the bride and her bait. Um, I have her. It's months and months after the castle blew up, and she's living in Munich, and mm. she's helping out, helping the sisters of Saint Francis Basilica prepare food and things. And she's really happy. And she showed up one night at this basilica and you know she cut herself a couple times in her arms she said oh i've, I've been running for months i've been the victim of x i have to find a war of uh, this war that's going on they said oh come on in you know and they treated her wounds and they treated her they didn't look any farther than her arms and they said the poor girl you know so, so they accepted her as she who she is and uh, so she's been there a few months and uh She's serving dinner to all these all uh, these elderly gentlemen, and she looks up and she sees in the corner, it's Dante, and he doffs his cap at her and bows, and she picks up a knife and she wings that at him and almost catches him, and Eesh. the knife drives itself into the floor, and the mother superior says, "What's with you?" She goes, "Oh, I saw a rat." Yeah, you know, she goes, "Oh, be careful with those knives," you know, so. <laughs> So she knows Dante is around and probably the monster is, is no, not far behind. And she goes, I've got this really great life and he, they come along and to spoil it. So, you know, I'm having a, a blast with, with uh, you know, the yeah. bride. Yeah, I mean, that is, that's a big splash. I, I remember when you were, when you just conjured that up, the muse hit you and you were talking about it. And then, and then came Dante. I knew it was going to be a great, a great ride for you. No, no question. Um, and it's, it's. I, I love the like the read you you gave the other night at our Tuesday meeting. Uh, we we have a meeting on Tuesday for um, JWC. You could sign up at uh, Joe's Riders Joe's Riders Club. Uh, and join our forum and then there's a there's a meeting room on tuesday feel free to join and check it out um we do reads and stuff uh it'll be a lot of fun it, it was it was on tuesday um so yeah my work in progress that i've been working on i've been i've been finalizing a thing editing listening to it on the pdf reader my um my my process for that is um I, I listen to it on the on a, on a PDF reader. A good quality PDF reader basically turns it into an audiobook, and it kind of sounds like a GPS is reading it to you. But you still get to hear how the language comes across audibly, hmm. and it, it's a big help. All the all the old masters used to have reads. If you're dealing with the Inklings, if you're dealing with the Beatniks in their in their apartments, uh, they would read their stuff. Um, kind of like a private open mic. It goes back to the antiquarian uh, parlor sittings and all that stuff. Poet poetry reads and hymn sings and all that. Uh, so I, I find that I, I beyond reading at JWC, I, I I do I do it that way, and then I comb edit. Uh, besides, no, nothing creative. Uh, I'm trying to get that finished up because I, I want to get it to the editor. Um, but I'm going to have another project right after that, Chiron 6, a sci-fi novel, uh, which is going to be a lot of fun to write. I just had a big, bright muse flash about that uh, this afternoon, actually. Um, but the outline is too nebulous to even get into it yet, so I'll pass on that. Um, lots of projects in the works, though. So... Now that we've had our, our intro and uh, we're all on the same page, um, I was hoping that we could do some reads for this episode, kind of like what we did on Tuesday, but with different material. Um, but I have no doubt with you two that it's going to be a real, a real tasty read. So, a Amber, do you have anything that you'd like to read uh, today on the live stream? Yeah, I have a piece called Love Thy Neighbors. It's a piece of crime fiction that's a little intense, but there's not any kids except mine around. <laughs> well, th that's cool. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with an R rating. Uh, so why don't you lay it on us and let us know what's going on? 
All righty. Yep. A derelict house with sagging siding and a boarded up attic window squatted across from a vacant lot. Beer bottles and dog shit littered the weedy overgrown yard. Two rusty ancient sedans lurked in the cracked driveway, one of them on cinder blocks. Grimy windows in, the fr in front of the decaying structure overlooked a porch, a weather-beaten couch taking up residence on the warped stoop. Sean stood staring at the place for a moment in the shadows beyond the flickering yellow of the only working streetlight before he shook his head and circled around to the backyard. His foster mother thought he was in bed, but he had decided the time had finally come to take care of their more troublesome neighbors. He opened a window and climbed inside, reassuring himself that he would be tried as a minor if he were caught. He expected his heart to race, but he felt only mild curiosity, tempered by his anger and disgust. Rumor held that the electric had been shut off, so he'd brought a flashlight. He clicked it on, secure that the late hour would keep anyone from noticing his intrusion. The living room contained a couch slightly less ratty than the one on the porch, with a big TV that looked out of place in the shabby room. Fast food bags and ashtrays, an ill assortment of dirty clothes, and balled up messy diapers comprised the decor. Baby bottles cluttered nearly every surface with varying amounts of formula rotting inside. Sean moved into the dining room, his lip curling when he caught sight of pizza boxes and several meals worth of dirty dishes on the table. The place reeked of piss and cigarettes with an underlying faint scent of decay. He jerked the bandana from his head and used it to cover his nose and mouth. He knew that his all important task lay upstairs but he couldn't resist snooping. He crept into the kitchen as though determined to further anger himself. Dirty dishes were piled high in a sink filled with cold, scummy water. The stove held the remains of congealed food, and the filthy refrigerator rattled quietly in its corner, hooked to a gas generator. Opening the door, he saw that the fridge contained little more than a few takeout containers and tiny glass bottles. Sean picked one up to study it more closely. Ketamine. He knew enough to knew know that was a drug, he had heard about it on the crime shows his foster mother was always watching. His foster mother kept a neat house. Neatness was important to Sean, and these people with their drugs and loud parties interfered with the neatness in his neighborhood. Their house was only a few blocks from his own, but he had been awakened several times by emergency vehicles flying past his home to respond to some crisis. Chaos was anathema. It made his temper unpredictable, sharpened the hunger for blood. When things were tidy and everything was in its place, he could ignore that darkness. But these people had crossed the line one too many times. Get those dirty eyeballs off me, boy. The words drifted through Sean's memory, producing a burning tightness in his chest. The nastiness had to stop. Sean crept back into the dining room toward the second floor. The ancient stairs were creaky in the middle, but by keeping his back tight to the wall, he sidled up them quietly. He paused in the hallway, reorienting himself to the floor plan he had last seen in the light of day and was now navigating in the depths of night. Just to his left was a bedroom and with a quick turn at the head of the stairs, another bedroom door presented itself. The bathroom was down the hall. Sean went to the bathroom first, making no more noise than the whisper of his breathing. He might not waver in his decision, but he wanted to know everything before he acted. He wasn't certain why, but he needed to explore every room, revel in the rising wrath. His breathing remained calm, but that peculiar numbness over his mind kept anxiety at bay. The only thing he could feel was fury, that these people would dare to snatch what little peace he found in life. An acrid aroma stung his nostrils when he entered the bathroom. Blood in the freestanding sink, puke in the aged claw tub, mildew in the shower, who knew what horrors in the toilet bowl? A carpet of dirty towels muffled his footsteps. He caught sight of his reflection in the vanity mirror, just a skinny teenager's face bisected by a crack in the glass. A dark haired youth with a pockmarked face. Harmless, right? At least until he turned 18 when people might start to see a delinquent instead if he wasn't careful. Sean shook his head and went to the middle room, the nursery. 
This room was in better shape than the rest of the house, but only in that the furniture and everything in it was the sort of beautiful second-hand condition that suggested the intervention of either a social worker or a crisis pregnancy center. One glossy chestnut crib with a sleeping infant. Sean stared at her for a long time. Something about her bothered him, but he could give no name to what it was. Usually when something bothered him, he knew exactly what was to be done, and his answer was often violent. But this baby, he wasn't sure. He left the baby's room, wandered down the hall to her parents' room. He turned the flashlight off before he went inside. Here he found more of what he expected. Both were too strung out to awaken even if the roof fell in, which from the angle of the ceiling fan was likely to happen soon. Sprawled on a bare mattress riddled with cigarette burns were the problems themselves. A stained bedsheet barely covered the wasted naked flesh, and the woman still had a needle in her arm. Sean stared at them, breathing in the unpleasant, musky miasma in the room. After many moments, he decided this would be the perfect place after all. Both of them were so dead to the world that neither would be awakened by what he was about to do. Satisfied, Sean pulled out his knife. Unfolding the blade made a tiny click in the darkness as it locked into place. He studied the freshly sharpened edge for a moment in the dimness. Then it made a surprising meaty sound as he brought it down. The man tried to scream, but only managed a weak gurgle as Sean yanked the knife from his chest. Sean's arm came down again and again, as though gripped by some dark force outside his body. Again and again, in a frenzy he could no longer control. This man had said ugly things to his foster mother. Called her a word Sean didn't like to even think about. This man had mugged his foster father, though the law could prove nothing. The woman groaned as her man cried out weakly, but whatever was coursing through her veins kept her unconscious. When Sean staggered back for a moment to catch his breath, she flopped onto her side. He stared at her for a long moment, the coppery scent clinging to his nostrils a welcome improvement from the general reek of the household. What would that tiny infant's fate be with such a mother? Sean could imagine a mother like this trading her child to a man for a fix. He had heard enough stories in the group homes. Better to be an orphan than with this woman. Now that the nasty piece of work of a father had been dealt with, Sean needed to take care of this poor excuse for a mother, too. Sean walked to the other side of the mattress and knelt beside it. The woman was so emaciated that every vertebra in her spine was evident. She smelled even worse up close, musky and cloying like a wild animal. He considered his options for a moment before he gripped a fistful of her hair to pull her chin back and sliced her neck open. Blood fountained black in the dimness. She made no sound at all. After a few moments, he realized the weird noise assaulting his ears was not his imagination. The baby was crying. He went into the child's room and studied her again. This time, instead of a reddish, doughy lump of formless flesh, she looked much more alive. Her little fists beat the air, her mouth open in a repetitive wailing. It bothered him that she was clad only in a diaper. The baby howled while he stared at her, blood dripping from hand and blade. He couldn't think what to do with her, but he knew it wouldn't be right to leave her here. Who knew how long it would be before anyone of her parents missing? He returned to the bathroom. Setting the bloody knife on the edge of the sink, he turned on the taps and washed his hands. Then he rinsed the knife, drying it thoroughly before folding it and putting it in his pocket. He dried his hands, wiped his prints off the sink and faucet handles, and went back to the nursery. The baby's screams grew louder. That wouldn't do. The neighborhood was bad, but that didn't mean there weren't neighbors nearby to raise a commotion. Sean grumbled to himself as he reached into the crib and scooped up the child. Her skin was incredibly soft. He held her at arm's length while she flailed and screamed, knowing he was doing it wrong. What did he know about babies? Think, think. Please stop, he begged, more distressed by her cries than by those her father made each time the knife went in. <laughs> the screaming only grew more shrill. What was it the home ec teacher said? Never shake a baby. But what had she said to do instead? How was he to quiet this red, wrinkled, shrieking lump of flesh? He placed her against his shoulder, ignoring the blood spatter, and gingerly patted her back. 
Her screaming died down to whimpers and she locked one of her fists in his shirt. He pried the tiny fingers free and laid her on the changing table. He wasn't familiar with babies, so it took some time before he managed to get her dressed. She stared up at him with a bemused look, as if wondering what sort of creature he might be. You really don't want to know, kiddo, he muttered, putting an unopened can of formula into the diaper bag, along with the few diapers and a single pack of wipes he could find. He put, it in, a, he put in a few baby clothes, a fleecy blanket, and slung the bag over his shoulder. Then he stuck a pacifier in the baby's mouth as though she could be corked like a bottle and carried her downstairs. After a bit of searching, he found the car seat. It too was secondhand new, printed with cutesy little flowers and insects. He wrestled with the safety seat for longer than he had wrestled with dressing the baby, careful not to transfer any of the blood on his clothes onto the baby or her things. She was squirmy, making urgent little noises through her pacifier and her wriggling interfered with strapping her in. Finally, it was done. He carried the baby in her seat out the back door with the diaper bag dangling from his other hand. Humming to himself, he cut through back ways until he reached his foster father's Prius. He set the car seat and diaper bag on the pavement, rummaged about in the back seat of the car, and covered his bloody t-shirt with a plaid button-down shirt. Then he put the car seat on the floor of the passenger side where the baby wouldn't be visible to anyone. He put the bag on the seat above her and crept into the house for the keys. What he needed to do now would be quick, then he would be able to get on with his new life. Hopefully his foster parents wouldn't kick him out if he was caught using the Prius. Thankfully the things were blessedly quiet, unlike the inexpli unexplicable burden squirming inside. I know exactly what to do with you now, he said as he climbed into the driver's seat. I know where you will be safe and loved if luck is on your side. The baby spat out her pacifier and fussed at him. He corked her again. John turned on the radio, scanned the stations, and chose an oldie station before he drove away. Between the soft music and the vibration of the moving vehicle, the baby settled into a fitful doze. He sighed with relief because he had a 10-minute drive ahead of him and didn't want to listen to a baby cry the whole time. She was deeply asleep by the time he reached his destination. It was a suburban neighborhood, not glamorous, but white picket fence nice. Sean pulled up in the darkest hours before dawn, parked alongside the road in front of one of the houses, and turned off his headlights. He didn't dare shut the Prius off for fear the lack of vibration would wake her. He looked at the house he was parked in front of, finding satisfaction in its clean lines and tidy yard. The pale blue siding wasn't new, but it was in excellent condition. The same car in the driveway was the Oldsmobile, and the sidewalk leading from the road to the front step was lined with flowers. He had been in the house from time to time, in his guise as a harmless schoolboy. He knew that it was as nice inside as it was on the outside, and the shepherds were lovely people. Mr. Shepherd taught math at Sean's school in a way that finally made sense to him. He wasn't supposed to know that Mr. Shepherd was shooting blanks, but it was a common knowledge that the young couple wanted to start a family. Mrs. Shepherd was a lawyer and had recently begun to study adoption law. They should be able to keep the baby even after her parents were found dead. John climbed out of the Prius, went around to the passenger side, and carefully extracted the car seat and diaper bag. The baby shifted and made small noises but did not awaken. He left her in her seat covered her with the fleecy blankie and carried her to the shepherd's front stoop. He set her down so that the screen door wouldn't hit the car seat when it was opened in the morning. He set the bag beside the car, her car seat, pulled out a baby wipe, and removed his fingerprints from the car seat and diaper bag. Tucking the used wipe around his index finger, he ran the doorbell and sprinted for the running car. The Prius gave a little squeal as he peeled away from the curb, but he couldn't allow himself to be caught in the neighborhood. He made it home in record time and snuck back into the house. He peeked in on his foster parents to be sure they were still asleep before he crept back into his own bed, satisfied with his night's work. Wow. <clears throat> what a ride. That was a, that was a nice trip. Um, very, very immersive. Draws you in right away. I mean, that, that scene uh, was brutal. Uh, brings me back to Burroughs' junkie um, 
and then getting getting in there, the actual act itself, um, and and what tension you've summoned uh, when we discover there's a baby, and he ends up being some kind of. Um, I mean, he's a, obviously a dark angel, but he's he's for this kid. I mean, this kid was was doomed to like a train spotting situation. Uh, so it's like he he saved he saved the kid, and um, I mean, the violence was good, very very uh, brutal, um, and without without you know waiting wallowing in it, um, <clears throat> tasty that way, and the work with tension and stuff, and and. The forensic thing you did, and, and what what else is like that that we're there's a, there's mystery here. Like, I don't know what chapter this is, but I I want to hear more. So, it's real it's real good. It's real tasty all around. Tom, what did you think of that read, man? That was really good. I was wondering, you know, it's um, what do you call it? Uh, it 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 touches on edges of things I'd like to know more about. Mm-hmm. You know. And um, absolutely, yeah, you know, it's a a really deep, bloody urban uh, fantasy that uh, you know. I, I don't usually read too many of those, but uh, a, a good one I'll I'll jump into, and that's that one. I would probably I would probably go with yeah. You know, it's uh, yeah. I'm wondering, I'm wondering also if the baby's in good hands as the guy drives away. Um, who knows? Yeah. Well, he seems the MC. If if that's, uh, I'm pretty sure that's the MC. But uh, the MC seems to be confident, and and his his or her surveillance is 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 expansive. Um, this is an intellect at work, and given the borrowed car, the the step parents, the age is very very mysterious. Uh, it makes me wonder, like, what exactly we're dealing with here. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Tom, if you got anything else. Or I maybe, mean, you know, if, if, is the, uh, the place where he, the baby was dropped off, are they going to be, they're going to be the victims of this little, whatever this, this little guy is. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe <laughs> I'm, oh, go ahead. Just a standalone short story. Ah, uh, but you could do a lot more with it. Yeah, I mean, when we're done, <clears throat> done with that read, I, I would love to hear more. Mm. Um, and it, it's totally like blo- it's blooming. I mean, you you have a situation there where there's so much mystery, there's so much more to tell or, and and ask. And like, because I'm not exactly sure why he was there. I'm not exactly sure of a lot of things, but just who this person is, this, this main character is, is would be worth exploring. Um, Cause that, 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 that neighborhood too, that yeah. uh, there's a lot around the edges. Let's put it that way, that uh, you could yeah. do a whole thing with a whole book on just that what's going on in a neighborhood and, and how this, this person interweaves through all the potential horrors and, and, and darkness of uh, yeah. the neighborhood. Could be like a uh, what's that guy's name? Um, oh boy, uh, by Jim Butcher. We could be like a story where the, the city never ever gets daylight. You know, it becomes morning and daytime, but not light. You know, strictly daytime, but according to the clock. But uh, it's always maybe always dark out. You know, I thought that would be interesting. So. Mm. Dig it. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the mark of a good short story is that it feels like a pilot for something bigger. Uh, there is definitely a, a, a conclusion there. The baby's dropped off. The, you know, the, 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 the folks are, are, are dead and he seems to have mopped up pretty good. So he's covering his tracks, which means very hungry for more. But, but you know, the pathology is there. So the mm. idea, the idea you couldn't do more uh, going forward, um, just a, it was sure. a great read. It was a great read. It's, what what was, go ahead, Tom, go ahead. Sort of ends on a question mark for me. Yeah. You know, like yeah absolutely. More, more to come, question mark, or, you know. 
Yeah, well, that's that's my biggest question. Um, but here's another. Uh, Amber, what, where, what was the inspiration for this for this character? Where where did the MC come from and and the the story? Because I'm sure our listeners would want to know, you know, being how it was read well and written well, you know. So um, go ahead. Sorry. I don't know, man. It's just one of those things that come to me when I watch true crime. Hmm. Oh, I see. So you get you like you you um, immerse yourself in the genre. You watch shows and you read uh, in that genre. And then all of a sudden the character creeps up on you and it's like create creative obsession kicks in and you, you got to write it. Right. Right. And uh, just one of these days I was sitting around and I'm like, you know, what would a, what would a avenging serial killer do if they killed somebody who had a baby? Hmm. And yeah. I, and it's like, well, they wouldn't kill the baby because they're only an avenging serial killer and the baby hasn't done anything wrong. So find them a hun then, like they're a puppy. Ah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get it. And it, it is, it's a trend in um, psychopaths that some of them seem to have, I mean, as far as in fiction is concerned, I'm not qualified to comment uh, clinically, but uh, psychopaths seem to have a, a code in a lot of fiction. Sure. There, there's, there's, there's things they won't do. Like they're not into harming animals, harming kids. I don't know if that applies. Not um, in real life so much because uh, real life sociopaths will harm anybody they can get their greasy fingers on. Hmm. Normal, normally it's because they're not feeling um, humanity uh, almost in any way mm. and the, the way they operate they have to do what they do in order to encounter feeling uh, hmm. otherwise everything feels numb and that is the inconsistency between something like um, Dexter or like a Hannibal Lecter like it, I read all of Harris I love Harris uh, I don't get into the genre very often of thrillers I mean, your stuff's really good. Obviously, you can hear it the way it was read. But it's like um, Hannibal Lecter, is, as brutal and gruesome and monstrous as he is, would never hurt a child. Hannibal mm -hmm. Lecter would never hurt an animal. Like, uh, as in cruelty. Like, yeah. he'll, he'll light you up like, like a, a firecracker. He'll destroy you uh, if you offend him or if you're rude or if you've slighted something that he values or if you've detracted from something he values right. be be yeah, cause he, he shows up like some kind of uh, gargoyle and, and finishes you off but there's things he wouldn't do mm -hmm. so that's the thing um this, your go ahead tom there's a character i happen to like a lot he's in a, a oh close to two dozen novels his name is serge storms uh mm -hmm. by tim dorsey Runs around Southern Florida. Uh, he only kills people that bother him. Mm. The annoying guy behind him on the beeping too much, or <laughs> uh, you know the 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 snotty waiter, or um, uh, the uh, the occasional uh, investigative reporter, or or private de detective that gets too close to him. Um, but otherwise, he's sweet as pie. He's he's a, you know amazing. <laughs> Fun person to be with, you know. Just don't uh, tick him off. So that's a different type of character, also. That uh, yeah, yeah I, I think that the way to the way to explain something like this is you have like you you know you have a psychopath, you know, and then and then there's like a a, a killer, mm. and and the killer. Um, we're not making light of this. This is just how it is. As far as like uh, police work, they these these killers have have careers. You know, they they go and they have they have methods, they have rituals, they have things they have to do in order to you know feel anything, uh, and they have to self preserve, which is you know that that's premeditation. I don't know that this was a crime of passion. I'm not like what you read, Amber. I'm not sure. But there are, uh, you know, some of these that are like serial killers, they have to establish a routine. They have to be able to get what they need. 
And it's like that is pushing against their psychopathy because, you know, yeah, they want to kill everything, but they also want to maintain a certain profile. And in some instances, there's like a certain mode of operation, uh, you know, and they they don't want to. I mean, I think if a dog gets in their way, they're going to kill a dog, you know, but but in your in your your main character's case, you know, he he rescued the kid. He wasn't such a monster that he left the baby there to be found and maybe be dehydrated or dead, some horrible fate. Sure. So he felt, he felt that much. So there must be something interesting with his, um, with his psyche. And that's, again, that's a thing to explore. Hmm. Um, so it's like, dig it. If it's a one-off, it's a one-off, whatever the muse wants, there's no reason to upset the muse. But I mean, I, I, I for one would love to hear more from that. Sure. Um, I have a question. Go right ahead. This is about great. your your drafting process. Uh, I, I you did say before that you wrote you write on your phone. If I tried to write on my phone, it would be, you know, you could never translate it. Um, <laughs> it's just one of those things. But uh, do you use uh, like a Dragon software for your on your phone, or you type it with your fingers? Type it with my fingers into Google. Ooh. I'd have Amazing. to have a huge phone. <laughs> I can but, uh, I can edit on my phone, but I can't compose. Wow! I, I, I guess that could work. Yeah. You touch type on your phone. Uh, your editing process. You do a. Uh, how many drafts do you do before you feel you're you're almost there or you're there? Well, these days it generally takes one draft plus uh, about three or. Four sweeps of editing. Okay. To take multiple drafts, but I've been doing this for twenty-five years. Hmm. You got to feel for it after a while. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. And then to compose that with minimal drafts and only a few sweeps. I mean, that's that is that is talent right there. Um. So, uh, Tom, you have any okay. other questions about uh, the read? But the read itself, no. I, I was, I, I, I enjoyed that. It was, um, you know, I do like a good blood, blood soaked tale once in a while. You know, it's, uh, yeah, it was very, very good. Absolutely. Um, so, if you don't have anything else to uh, say about it, uh, Amber, we're gonna move on because I think Tom, you have something you're gonna read too, right? This sure. is a real, it's a real treat to have uh, reads on here. Um, so, what is it, Tom? What are you going to read for us? I have a, a novel I'm in the middle of um, called "Blood on the Sand." Uh, it, one sentence: A uh, cookbook author uh, tries to stop a bloodthirsty, legendary creature from uh, killing people. Um, let's see. Boy, oh boy, boy. Comes out of the ocean during a storm in southern Florida and, and snatches people off the beach. And uh, so uh, what happens is the main character and his girlfriend, new girlfriend or whatever, um, they discover that there's actually a possibly a creature, a real creature that um, could be at work behind this, that lives in the Bahamas. So they take a trip to the Bahamas. And they they find a uh, they have a, a taxi driver who's a scholar. Uh, his name was Mal. He's a, he's he's he just drives taxis just to meet new people. And um, he's um, there. They invited him. Well, he's he said, "I'll show you around, and I know all the I know the history of the island. If you have any questions." So they said, "Why don't we just use him? We'll ask around about." Uh, local histories that everything he knows about this creature. So they invite him to breakfast in the Blue Hole Grill uh, in, in the, at the Challenger Inn on Andros Island. And uh, they just told him a little bit about Jake. Jake is the main character. He told him, he told Maul the story of um, his encounter with the creature, how he got interested in it, that he saw a Mr. Jenkins get pulled off the beach by something that was just a mass of darkness. And he's been trying to figure out what's going on and and the more he digs the more he finds that it's just not not just one 
disappearance slash murder. It's it's uh, quite a few. So um, he just told about his his experience uh, that scared him to death, but it spurred him on to just discover what was going on. So uh, Jake says, um, "How oh, they asked?" Ball asked, um, "Let's see. I take this. I take it there's more to the story." Jake says, "Oh yeah, the police." The police filed a missing persons report that would have been the end of it were not for a friend of mine. Um, his name is Lou, and he owns a diner in Hollywood. We were talking about the guy who had just disappeared when Lou mentioned that someone else had vanished three years ago in the same circumstances. And what circumstances would that be? Asked Mal. Both victims disappeared on nights when the when the there was a new moon and there was a thunderstorm at the same time. Now that's interesting. Those two things couldn't happen all that often, or could they? Often enough, said Jake. How many victims are we talking about? Elaine squeezed Jake's arm. She saw his anxiety rising. Let me, Jake nodded and, and drank some more coffee. We found over 125 missing people. Miles whistled. Turn some heads. 125? Saints preserve us. Are you sure? Do you think, did you take into account accidents, runaways, and just plain murders? We did. And that's the number we came up with. Sheesh, said Mal. I'm almost afraid to ask, but I will. What brings you to my beautiful, peaceful island? His smile dropped, uh, dropped almost into a, a leer. Our research picked up some sightings of something that the, that accomp accomplishes us a fair number of disappearances in the, on this island. What sort of sightings? Something at, lar at least as large as your taxi. Something pitch dark and very much alive. Miles' blood drained from his face. He reached into his ratty vest and pulled out a leather-bound flask. He slapped half of its contents into the, his coffee mug, putting more coffee and cream into it and drain the entire contents before they putting the mug down on the table with a thud. You speak of the Luska, said Mal, his voice dropping to a whisper, don't you? Elaine nodded, afraid to speak. Mal began to breathe from his mouth, moisture running down his cheeks. Do you know what you're saying, lass? Do you don't? You don't want such a beast in your neighborhood. That's our conclusion, said Jake, finally. From what we could find out from the internet, it's the only thing that fits the le the legends and, and recent reports telling of striking, you know, strike something striking in the dead of night, mostly fishermen, like my uncle Sean said. Mal, he told he told me and my dad he was going to go off fishing at midnight for some mahi mahi for his wife and kids for the holiday feast the next day. My dad wanted to go with him, but Uncle Sean was a, stu a stubborn cuss. Wouldn't take anyone with him. Said he was, he was, said it was a family thing and he needed to do it by himself. He paused to blow his nose with a, a green handkerchief. What happened, asked Jake, if that's not too personal. No, it's just memories. I don't want to, I don't often touch, get in touch with. Take your time, said Elaine. She got up and talked to one of the waiters. He disappeared into the back, only to emerge with a moment later with a tray. She came back with a tray full of uh, small fruit pastries. Mal's smile turned, returned as for a, a minute as he bit into one. Sea grape tarts, he muttered, and he, as he licked his fingertips. How did you know they were my favorites? Elaine smiled. I saw a small jam stain on your pockets, she pointed to Mal's chest. He pointed, he picked a dot of, of lint off of it and scraped it off the, with a nail and popped it into his mouth. So I want to, I, I went to the waiter and asked him if he knew what your favorite dessert was. And, he, and, we, and here we are. I thought it might help you live through the, with some comfort food. You're a lucky man, Jake, said Mal. He's, he bit into one of the, another tart. Don't you let her go, you hear? Oh, I won't, said Jake, giving Elaine a, an extended kiss. Charming, said Mal. 
He. I saw you know, uh, boy. I, I just saw long and long hand. Uh, he let his thoughts went back to his childhood. I didn't see him leave in his boat. It was just a bit. I was just two bits big one morning. Bit for me to handle, and Uncle Sean managed. Oh, the boat. It was an old sailboat that had been motorized long ago. Could handle any the toughest seas. Twas a beauty. Called it Mora after his wife. He paused to take some more coffee. No more booze, said Jake. No, I just needed it for the shock of your story. Anyway, Uncle Sean didn't come back the next day. Uh, and the next day, Aunt Mora called the Coast Guard to, to go look for him. That night, they towed Sam's boat back in. It was a wreck. I was 13 at the time, but old enough to remember it all. One mast was snapped at the base, and a bit of, and six foot of railing was missing. And your uncle, gone. There was blood, and my dad turned to block it, me from seeing it. I saw enough. That was the first time I heard the word Luska. How awful for you, said Elaine. She wiped a tear from her eyes. It's devastated my dad, my mom, and especially my Aunt Mora. They were never the same again. Aunt Mora packed up her bags of two kids and went to Ireland. Haven't seen them since. Anyway, you think you have a Luska in your, on your hands? One at, one at the very least, said Jake. Although I don't know how long they live. How long do octopuses live anyway? Depends on the octopus, said Mal. Some live only five or six years, while others last 25 or 30. As far as these giants, there's no telling how long they may live. Where has it been feeding? That's a good question, said Jake. As far as we've been able to figure, it moves between North Miami and Agate City up near Daytona. Mal took out his, his phone and tapped a few fingers for a bit. His eyes shot up. Quite a bit of territory for, for this. All right. Um, is there any, any sort of pattern? He laid you out a, a small map and fold, unfolded it. We think it doesn't like the cold weather in the winter months. The victims show up in a, in a season pattern with the temperature, the creature moving south between November and February every year. How many years are we talking about, asked Mal. At least 36 years, said Elaine. Are you sure of that? We searched far, as far back as 45 years, said Elaine. There's nothing past 36 years ago. And this Mr. Jenkins is the most recent victim, as far as we know, said Jake. Impressive work, said Mal. There's a small saying, know your enemy. I say we set out to get to know this this bugger as well as possible. Maybe we can at least get enough for you to figure out how to kill it. I'm ready when you are, said Jake. Me too, said Elaine. Then let's get cracking. Chapter 17, Searching for the Devil in Paradise. Before we before we crack open the books, there's someone I'd like you to meet. His, his brains you can pick, said Jake, as, as they strapped into the taxi. Who, said Jake? Professor Quincy Aberlin. He runs the Andros Maritime Museum in Old Town. What he doesn't know about the Bahamas isn't worth knowing. Sounds good to me, said Jake. Enjoy the scenery. I've got someone, some idea is in my head to, to untangle. Mal eased out into light traffic and they headed south, north. The view turned into one of, of tall trees and bright flowers. Elaine leaned against Jake and closed her eyes. Jake held her close, losing himself in the center of her hair. Ma went on to say something, but smiled and remained silent until they pulled into the museum parking lot. The jolt of the brakes shook Elaine awake. Sorry, I dozed off, said Elaine. Oh, I'm not sorry, said Jake. He gave her a kiss. Ready to go? Sure, let's get some, let's see this professor. Ma took them inside and Jake and Elaine were, were suitably impressed. Everywhere they looked, they saw the, they saw either pirates or conquistadors or natives in their sta their standard regalia. Jake saw spears, spars, and sea... Boy, something. Um, anyway, while Elaine stopped to inspect each coin, she some coins she beheld. These, are, these coins are exquisite. A lot of them are, look newly minted. Lots of ships went down near here in the, in, in the, over the centuries, said Mal. 
Uh, entire ships have been found sitting in the bottom, just waiting for someone, some crew, salvage crew or adventurer to discover. I'll bet, said Jake. Come, we have, if we have time to visit this later on, the professor is waiting. Is he, said Jake. You called him? I did. I told why you pay the bill back at the blue hole. Oh, good. Let's not waste any time. Right this way. They headed for an old an old dog door marked Quincy Aberleen, Professor Emeritus, Amity University. Mel knocked, Mel knocked three times. Seconds later, the door opened, and the two looked upon the face of Professor Aberleen. Aberleen looked like any one of the fishermen that they had seen at the lodge. His cut-off jeans needed stitching along the pockets, and his T-shirt sported a series of sharks taking bites out of the words Eat Me and St. Thomas. A circle of steel gray hair surrounded a shiny bald spot on his head. It made him look more like a monk than a professor. A red street gray goatee framed a face uh, pinched in the middle with two small ears. Mal, my old friend, said the professor, extending a thick hand with stubby fingers. Come on in. Who's your friends? These are the people I told you about a half an hour ago. Ah, the monster hunters, he said with a smile. Come on in. We have lots to discuss. Aberlene's office was three times as long as it was wide. Jake estimated at, at about 10 by 30. He smiled as he saw the walls were lined with photos of fishes, sea turtles, and various octopi. Jake stopped walking as he came upon a, a series of of drawings and photos, none of them were in focus, and they seemed to be have a single subject, sea monsters. Professor Aberlein came up to Jake. Ah, my great obsession. I know what you're thinking. I'm some sort of loony who believes in UFOs and, and the like. The thought had flashed through my mind, no offense, none taken, for I don't care about any of those subjects. But lake monsters, ah, they have always attracted my attention. It's what gets me up into uh, biology and eventually into oceanography. Okay, I'll buy that. For some, it could have been a hobby. Yes, however, in my case, it's personal. You've had your own sighting, said Elaine. Yes, Lake Champlain, 1978. I was between semesters at Miami University and took a trip with four others to enjoy the lake. My secret hope was to do some personal research while doing there. Boy, did I get some hard experience i can tell you please have a seat the professor led them to his desk at the end of the room it was in position to face a well wall size uh window overlooking the caribbean sea what a view said jake uh, yes it, it's 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 inspiring now to my story um he was on. He basically was on 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 a boat with friends. A moment later, something rose from the water. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Uh, luck was with me, and I had my camera. I I am amazed I got the one shot before the creature uh, slipped below the surface. Wow, what luck! Said Jake, looking over at Elaine, who looked skeptical. She smiled at him and and winked. Yes, here's the shot I got. He posted picture on the on the wall hidden from view um angle uh, blah, blah. uh jake and elaine turned to look a four by four photo a joint i adored the adorn the wall a subject was a photo uh lay in full view to jake it looked like a dolphin surfacing maybe some maybe up to three dolphins you only got the one shot said elaine she said i was lucky to get that in 98 percent of all paranormal sightings cameras in the cameras either jam or don't work yes i've heard that said elaine but i was quite fortunate champ has been particularly difficult to photograph the best the best was by mrs maxine connor in 1980 the best analysis reveals it to be a living creature about 35 to 40 feet long um let's see can we talk about the sea creature this mind that we have in our in our vicinity, of course. Why else would we be here? Let's get down to business, shall we? That sounds good," said Jake. Anyway, so they meet with the professor who tells them the history of the Luska, and um, nice. he gives them a bunch of information and photos and legends and everything. And they go, basically, they go home to um, 
<laughs> yeah, they spent a few days at the at the at the resort, and then they said, "We've got to get back. We gotta we gotta kill this thing." So he promises. Jake promises Elaine that they'll when this is all over and done with, we'll spend a month here at, at the island, and and uh, so she's hoping to have a honeymoon there, and uh, you know he's still a little bit shy, but uh, well, I mean. I dug that read, man. Uh, you know, um, I and and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is, this is your Florida novel, right? It is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Check out listeners. Check out last week's uh, live stream because we went over his his Florida novel. Tom writes um, on his vacation. He has a steady muse for his vacation. Whenever he goes to Florida. He writes this one project, and this is a, th- th- what he just read was a piece of that. So check out our last episode too if you want to learn more about that. Between the story and the process, it was it was really great to unpack that. And I, I love um, I love this project because the concept of a terrorize a, a terrifying carnivorous octopus that shows up with a storm on a black moon, which is like double jinx and this thing creeps onto the shore and you know god help you if you happen to be there uh because it's 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 got a healthy appetite for surface meat um and and it hunts that's a big broad range oh sure of of a hunting ground i mean when it comes to the ocean it's a little bit you know it's it's definitely possible to to range like that but just the, the concept of this monstrosity and, and the Luska being what it is, is a cryptid. Fantastic. I, I'm not going to ask the usual question because I think we covered it last time. Um, but what I will say is, is um, I don't know, how long do you think you're going to take, like how many years of vacation are you going to take <laughs> to finish this? And it, it's not... It's not a point of criticism. It's very clear to me that you're working. You're even working on your vacation. Your creative obsession knows no limit. Right. Where it's like I'm on vacation and I'm still writing. So it's like it's not like I'm saying you're <clears throat> you're slacking or nothing. Far from it. It's more like, <clears throat> are you having fun and are you going to keep doing this? How long do you think it will be? How many years? Well, I'm hoping that I could come home one one vacation and the the florida views is still with me and i can write yeah i'm gonna try it this year write a good month or more try to polish it off i would say i'm pretty close to half done um uh you know i I don't want to make it too long a book but um you know there's still a lot of maybe a lot of meat meat to go um you know now that that they're identifying the creature and they're they're um Taking a cue from the uh, Animal Planet shows, they're trying to see if they can get permission before a storm appears at certain towns to put up trail cams, mm. so that if it comes ashore, they they can get pictures of it coming, becoming, and going. And uh, that's very cool. Yeah, and um, very very cool. Um, I love cryptids interacting with trail cams or any <laughs> technology. Um, closed circuit television, whatever it is, there you, there's so much tension you can draw in your text by writing and alluding to something like that in that frame. It's like the spectator becomes the reader. You know, it's it's a mm. great scam as they're like, whoa, because there's something about there's something about. I mean, you know, photography is is evidence. Uh, yeah. So so it's like if you could actually get a picture of that, like the whole rake monster thing. Um, great. It was a great read. Uh, oh. a- Amber, um, what did you think of, of, uh, the read and what did you think of, uh, what's going on in that story? Well, I think it's pretty interesting and it's an unusual creature to be writing about. I hadn't heard of it until today. And I think I might have to add it to my collection of mythological creature stories. <laughs> it's very right interesting. On. Have you, you know, uh, do you know of, um, Oh boy, what's his name? Uh, his name is uh, Gates. Uh, he writes Destination, Destination, Expedition X, and Destination Truth. Uh, Josh Gates. 
Mm. Uh, no, I don't think I've seen those shows. He's he's got a he's got a number of shows, very popular show. You know, he did a he's got has a show called Destination Truth, where he uh, uh, he did uh, he went down to Andros Island to look for the Luska, and um, he was down in one of these blue holes, and uh, something kept uh, flashing past. Him and, and they were only get like a piece of it, and uh, one of the cameramen um, felt something. Something grabbed his foot, and uh, so it, it, they deemed that it was too little, maybe potentially too dangerous for the star of our show to be in this uh, two hundred feet down with something, whatever it is. So they they said yeah. he did the rest of the show from the shore, saying, "Yo, know, I, I feel much safer here." So I, I think I, I watched that. <laughs> two months or so before I went down to Florida in 2018, and then I'm sitting down here, and there was a beautiful storm at night, and all of a sudden I put the two and two together. I said, what if the Luska came here? And done. You know? So that Marvelous. was... Marvelous. Uh, yeah. Marvelous. Right after I had finished re writing uh, Sheriff Andrews and the Giant Toads, because I always write everywhere, so... Yeah, so... That's that's the last thing. Um, that Toad story is fantastic <laughs> be because of the nature of the thought experiment. Everything with fiction like this, especially sci-fi or, or horror, there should be a nice thought experiment embedded into it. And one of that is, say I, I walk outside my house and there's a, there's a toad, you know, the size of a, of a horse or whatever. Garbage truck. Yeah, or, or which is like, <laughs> whoa, what do I do with that? You know, um, and 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 again, the Luska itself, a huge mm. octopus compared to the size of a car. Yeah. Uh, so the simulator is like, well, I can't live with that going on. So what do I got to do? Like, how do I destroy this threat? Or I mean, it, it doesn't look like it's going to be reasoned with. So it turns into what do, what do I got to play with here? I mean, if I don't have military hardware, mm -hmm. uh, I, the first thing I always think about is uh, my old d dynamite hatchet routine. Take a dynamite, stick a dynamite, uh, cut it in half, wrap it up, fuse it, duct tape it to a hatchet, and you just go. Mm -hmm. and, and it provided you got a waterproof fuse and all that, because um, in the event, because again, you're dealing with this thing in a storm. The toads are one thing. Yeah. You know, the toads are like, hit, hit it with dynamite or run a car into it and hope that you don't, you know, you know what I'm saying? So right. it's like, I, I don't want to crack it open, but it's like, that's the first thing I think of when there's a, a big, terrible monster is like, well, you got to protect people who can't protect themselves. It's not, yeah. I, I don't want to kill this thing. It's not what I got up wanting to do. But if it's a giant creature taking up my whole driveway and it threatens my family it's like well evolution you know time time to survive time to time to overcome yep. uh so you got to step outside of the whole uh passive state so how would you um this is probably on the spot but uh well i guess you're still figuring out if if they're gonna kill it i, I know uh, how i know how they're gonna destroy it um oh man so that's well, I don't know. I don't know if you should disclose. No, but I had a flash this morning, and I have to write it. Is that yeah. I was writing the point of view of the monster, and yeah. I wrote up the the one where that Jake saw that the incident, and I I, I threw in a little line that the uh, the creature detected that Jake was in his house, his condo, watching it, and that it basically that the 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 Luska said. It might know I'm I exist uh, and I'm going to file that this creature in the back of my mind. Maybe I'll come back and visit, you know. So I, I came up with an idea what if on one storm, instead of going to eat, it revisits Jake's condo and like tears at the pieces trying to get at him, <laughs> dude? A, a squid ripping a building apart, I mean, an octopus rather. That that would be something tasty to read, yeah. Uh, I mean, if you could get that on a home security footage, mm. just see, seeing its limbs like spilling around and, you know, coil, coiling around stuff, dragging stuff down, you know, like 
Ah, brutal. brutal. So I, he's got to try to bash a window in the back and try to climb out. And he's saying, thank God Elaine's not here tonight. She's she's elsewhere. Yeah, otherwise, the ones they could have gotten killed. And <laughs> I thought that would be an interesting. Uh, so they throw a little action into the, uh, you know. Right now, it's all in, it's investigating, and it's, you know, someone gets killed, they run, they drive down there and look around, and the other police yep. are, are mum about the whole thing because they do, they're like that. So I said, <laughs> you know. Wow, so. yeah. I mean, great, great stuff. <clears throat> and all good things, of course, must come to an end. Uh, we, it's already been, I think, around an hour, and I had a blast. It was like time travel. You know, you're the way you guys read, forget it. And I'm sure our listeners dug it, too. Um, thanks so much for your reading. Before we take off, though, uh, let's start with you, Amber. I know you have stuff to plug. I have stuff to plug. This is, this is what we got to do. Please support our, our work. We're creative obsessors uh, out there. The JWC sets up a great community uh, for the creative obsessor, for the creative writer to exercise their, their trade. But we all we're all book crafters. We want to we want books. We want to sell books uh, and have everyone get a hold of our work. So, Amber, go ahead. Lay it on us. What what are you plugging today? Uh, right now, what I have out is my updated version of Death's Nightmare, my debut novel. Oh, uh, very helpful reader helped me find an error that I made mm -hmm. and I had to uh, rewrite about a third of it. Wow. Big. big big plot hole it, spackling it would not have worked the spackling <laughs> <in> the <hole. laughs> it happens it happens that's why more readers more editors the, the better it is i mean um mm -hmm. but okay so that and your 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 name uh, amber danson is that what it is yeah. and, and that's death's nightmare and that's where is that on amazon yeah okay very good um Thank you very much. I would love because I read bits and pieces of that, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, and the stuff I had, it's not it's not dissimilar to your short story, but it, it has a slightly different vibe to it. But the same tension, the same uh, thriller, thriller atmosphere uh, and, and great use of language. So check that out, everyone. Um, Tom, you're up for plugs. I have a short story collection, uh, Dwellers in the Shadows. It's uh, the cover has a uh, it's a, it's like Nightfall and there's a spider web, so you don't confuse it with another book that has Dweller in the Shadows in it. Uh, it's available on Kindle, paperback, hardcover, uh, ebook, and it's also uh, on various things in draft to digital. It's a uh, Kobe and and I think it's Kobe and uh, Amazon and um, what's the other one? There's another one that I have that uh, that has I have it published on. Um, so I'm hey. trying to spread it out. And um, another and book in I'll oh, go another book in the works uh, called uh, another short story collection. It's is it still out there? Should be, hopefully Knockwood be out soon. So fantastic. So and that's Thomas Tiernan. Um, and what's the name of the collection one more time? Dwellers in the Shadows. Thanks, man. Um, I'm, you know, they, uh, you know, Ricky is great, but my, my author name is Richard Andrew Olkus, uh, O L K U S Z. I'm on Amazon. Um, I have a book on there called Babeltron After the Fire, it's a dystopian cyberpunk book. Um, lots of cyborgs, genetic abominations, street shamans, uh, classic, classic piece of the genre. I mean, when I first read William Gibson's Neuromancer, ever since then, I was like, I got to do, I got to try something like this. Cyberpunk, Shadowrun, mm -hmm. to totally where it's at uh, if, you're, if you're into tabletop gaming. But that's a whole other uh can of beans to open up uh but check it out richard andrew olkis babeltron amazon.com um and let us know what you think about it on our forums and on our social media this is this has been a great show jwc live stream 
story autopsy with Ricky and Tom and with our special guest, Amber. It was a blast having you on. Uh, thank you for the read. And um, say bye-bye to the audience, and we're going to take off, all right? Whoops. Bye, everyone. Good night, everyone.